Good morning. It is a beautiful day outside, so I'm really glad to see all of you in here because this would have been a beautiful day to decide that you were going to go do something else. So amazing and wonderful to have you all with us today. If you would, take the pew pads at the end of your pews and register your attendance for us. That's very helpful. Do we have guests with us today who would just raise your hand so we'll know that you are new and we can make you feel welcome? Wonderful. So great to have you all with us today. You will see in the bulletin some announcements and opportunities, things that are happening. I will say we had a fantastic time yesterday. Thanks to everybody who came out. We just had a great time. We need some cookies, so if you bake, you can bake us up some delicious cookies. If not, you can just go buy some and bring them in. But Charlotte needs some cookies so that we can be ready for Sunday morning fellowship times. Harvest Pack is coming up on the 30th of this month. There will be two sessions as usual, a 9 o'clock session that will end at 11 in the morning, and then we'll have lunch, and then there will be a noon session that will go from noon until 2. So if you have time, I hope you'll come and pack meals with us. We've done this for a good while now, and it really is an amazing operation. So I hope you'll make plans to come and join us for that. And then I will draw your attention to and then invite Lynn up to talk to us about the fact that it is almost time for stuffed animals again. Yay. Last year, I challenged you to bring in 1,000. You brought in almost 800. So I'm going to need you to step it up a little this year, okay? We want 1,000. I'm going to need you to go buy lots of stuffed animals. Lynn's going to tell you all about it, but I will tell you, if you don't want to shop for stuffed animals, you can bring a check to the church, just mark it teddy bears, and we will go find some stuffed animals for you. So before we prepare our hearts for worship, I don't know, I saw Lynn earlier. Where, there you are. Come on up, Lynn, and talk to us this morning. children who are um, there against their will I'm sure um, so we've been doing it for that long uh, last year as as they said we collected nearly 800 bears not just bears by the way for those of you who might be new um, any kinds of stuffed animals fine uh, we're prefer our preference is somewhere between 12 and 18 inches but we also like the little ones because we, one of the agencies we give to is Operation Christmas Child right here at the church. So if they fit in a shoebox, that's also wonderful. Um, so if you have any sitting around or you have enjoyment of shopping, Kohl's is having a sale right now, by the way. <laughs> so is Food City, I was told. Um, so I wanted to tell you, though, we have 16, actually almost 17 agencies that we deliver, distribute these, these animals to. So it's not just the hospital anymore. The hospital last year got 150 of those 800 bears. They would have taken more because they have several new pediatric surgeons who have, are now working at the hospital and those uh, stuffed animals are flying off the shelves. Um, but that's we had last year available to give them, and this year we're going to prioritize them even higher on the list so we can give them more if that's what they need. Because they are our first, they are our first and primary agency. But we also serve a number of others. We serve CASA, for those who don't know, that stands for Court, court Appointed Special Advocates. They work with children who are in the le uh, legal system who have ended up in court be typically because of their parents drug issues, and so forth. Uh, and so the CASA advocates give those out to the children. 
We work with both the uh, Fearful Glade Fire Department and the Crossville Fire Department. They carry them in the trunk of their cars and they absolutely love it if they end up in a situation where there's a child in crisis and they can just pull them out and get a smile, hopefully, or just smile onto a face. Um, I've told this story, so I forgive me if you've heard it before, but many years ago, my mother-in-law was suffering from the state, or I wouldn't even call it early stages of dementia. She was pretty well along. She was in a nursing home in Wisconsin, and my husband and I were struggling with what to get her for Christmas one year. And I said, I'm going to get her a stuffed animal. And after my husband kind of, <laughs> after the, like, what? It came over his face. And we, so I said, well, just trust me on this. I don't know why. I think it was a God thing. So I got her a stuffed cat. Um, well, it turns out our uncle, who was the one who visited her pretty much every week at the, house, at the nursing home, called us and said, she sleeps with it every night. She carries it everywhere. He said whenever he walked in a room, that that's what she was holding. And to the point that when she passed away, he asked for the cat in her memory if he could have it. And so I became, I became aware that senior citizens in crisis are as important to us as children in crisis. So we began distributing. So we have three nursing homes. Also, there are agencies. House of Hope, who deals with children um, and families actually who are in crisis situations. Uh, we just got a thank you note from them for our contributions last year. Uh, and they, so they really appreciate it because when they have children show up on their door, they've usually just been evicted from their homes or you know, there's something going on in that family. And um, so we do that. We housing authority who deals with low income families who are being resituated, we, that's one of ours. Crab Orchard Care Center, obviously op Operation Christmas Child. So we have a lot of agencies that we've started dealing with. That's why we need those thousand, that's why we need those thousand beers. So um, um, last year we decided that we needed to reach out beyond our church and involve other churches. Um, at so we did that, and we actually had, I don't know if any of you saw the article last year, one of the other, one church that got involved, they actually had a picture in the paper of them collecting their teddy bears for us, which is really nice. Uh, this year we're doing it again, and I, met, I had a meeting with um, Cumberland Fellowship Church, which is a downtown church. It's a really large church behind where the Kmart used to be where the Kmart used to be. If you've never lived here, you don't know where the Kmart used to be. <laughs> but um, if you have, you know where that is. And uh, I knew that they did an awful lot for the community. So I called them, and they have a f what they call First Sunday every month. And they, the, the donations they collect that month go to a community charity. And last month, we were their community charity. So, which I'm just really excited. I have no idea they're coming next Thursday to take pictures and offer us the check. But um, th that's, it is something that community-wide, the church, the, ch the school, the church, what do they call it? The Council of Churches, thank you, is also now involved. So, um, we just want you to enjoy and have fun. We will put the uh, teddy bear case, thank you, outside uh, right around April 26, 27, so that's Sunday. And we'll, so it'll be out there for a couple of weeks. The church also, also takes them. I know the church office um, will stow them away if you just want to bring them by early. But otherwise, bring them on Mother's Day, and we line them up up here and so that they can be blessed and go to where God wants them to go. And I have an awesome picture of Sharon last year. She was standing over the bears like this, and I keep it in my living room. It comes up in my little my frame as it goes around, and it makes me smile every time. But she, as she was blessed, was blessing the bears so that they could go where they need to go. So we ask your support and a thousand, right, Sharon? Yeah. All right, thousand bears. Thank you. Good morning. Please stand as you're able and join us as we enter into worship. One, 
Is the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are before your time to worship come just as you are before your God come just as you are to worship come just as you are before you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, just as you are before. are to worship come just as you are before your God come one two three four open the eyes of my heart to see you I want to see you open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you to see you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory your power and love as we sing holy 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 open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you open the eyes of my heart Lord Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Above all names, be 
As we go to our time of prayer together, I would ask you to see those persons who are listed in our bulletin that um, have had surgeries or procedures or tests recently and others who are at home, uh, hopefully healing from um, illness and surgeries as well. So let us pray. Holy and wondrous God, birdsong greets us in the pre-dawn darkness, reminding us that we are blessed to live in this place where we are free from the fear of war, where our skies are filled with flights of birds instead of drones, where the sounds of geese call from overhead instead of the screams of missiles, where our neighbors call to us in friendly greeting instead of with cries of anguish. We cannot fully understand the wars of the Middle East. We cannot understand our own inability to get along. As political candidates and parties continue to escalate divisions in our own nation, where we no longer listen to one another, talk with each other, debate and find consensus, but instead we cut one another off, do not listen, do not discuss, do not see anything or anyone but our own opinion, too often making others feel as if we disagree, then someone has to be wrong. Most merciful God, this world needs you. We need you to intervene to show us the way to bring about wisdom where there is only conflict to bring about calm, where there is only chaos to bring about peace, where there is despair. And so give us courage to be your people, people of the new covenant, people of your love and grace to a world in need. We lift into your care all whom we have named and others we hold within our hearts, trusting that you are already at work offering healing and strength. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Our gospel text this morning comes from Luke's gospel, beginning in the 24th chapter with the 36th verse. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace 
be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I, myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all of their joy, they were disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it. And ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was last with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer And to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses in these things. And our Eastertide reading from Acts beginning in the third chapter with the twelfth verse. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Fellow Israelites... Why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of your ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though they had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health. In the presence of all of you. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets. That his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God. So that your sins may be wiped out. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you. That is, Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning we have two texts which are essentially from the same scroll. Luke, who has recorded in our scriptures his gospel, is also the writer of Acts. And that in fact is one work. We have divided it into two so that the gospel portion of Luke's work comes with the other gospels An Acts, which is a continuation but a telling of the very first Christians, the very first followers of Jesus Christ, has been separated into its own book. So first we have Luke telling us about Jesus coming to see the disciples. And that section began with while they were talking about this. So we have to go back up just a hair to understand what they're talking about. Just before today's text from Luke has been the story of the road to Emmaus. Cleopas and his companion have left Jerusalem 
sad, discouraged. They are discussing Jesus' death as they walk toward their home, which is about seven miles away. It's basically a day's journey. And while they are walking and talking and downcast and sad, a stranger comes to them and they do not know him. And he asks them, what is wrong? And they respond, are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on? And they tell him that Jesus, whom they had followed and whom they had thought would be the Messiah, had instead been killed. And Jesus continues to be hidden from them in his reality. But he walks on toward their home with them. And the scripture tells us that he opens the scripture to them. He tells them the scripture in such a way that they receive new understanding from it. And when they get to their home, Jesus is going to go on. But they say to him, stay friend the night with us because traveling at night is a terrible idea. And so he comes in and he eats with them. And when he breaks the bread, he is revealed to them as Jesus, the Christ, the risen Christ. So that is what has just happened. And the next morning, Cleopas and his companion get up bright and early and they take off back for Jerusalem. Because they have to tell the other apostles. You see, this group that traveled with Jesus for three years, we typically know the names of those 12 that were closest. But it was a large group that traveled with him. And Cleopas and his companion probably had been traveling with Jesus for quite some time. They know the disciples well. So they go back to the room where they are all gathered and hidden, still in fear for their lives. And they begin to tell them what they have experienced. And while they are discussing this amazing thing that has happened, Jesus himself appears with them. Now, this is where the story gets a little weird, right? The doors are locked, but suddenly there's Jesus. And they know it's Jesus. It looks like Jesus. And so their first thought is, well, it's a ghost. And Jesus says, not a ghost. Hands, feet, side. Bones, flesh, not a ghost. And the disbelief that they have had over the past three days at the entire course of what is happening here is now at its fullest. How can this even be? And Jesus asks for food. And he eats in front of them because ghosts don't eat. And as amazed and excited and happy as they are, still they are relying on Jesus and Jesus' power. They can't come to an understanding. They can't even wrap their minds around what has happened on their own. Jesus has to reveal to them that he is fully human, not a ghost, here in their presence. And as he did with Cleopas and his companion, he opens the scripture to them and he begins to explain to them again How the Messiah had to be crucified and rise again on the third day. Our scripture from Acts also follows an important piece that we have to get or we don't really understand what's going on. Peter and James have gone to the temple. And they're at one of the gates called the beautiful gate. They happen upon a beggar. A lame beggar, a man whose feet and ankles have been messed up since birth, so he can't walk. And every day, his companions, his friends, his loved ones carry him to the beautiful gate and set him there so that he may beg for alms, which is the only way he can support himself. So he's sitting and he's begging. And Peter and James come upon him and he, his voice is ringing out, alms, alms for the poor. 
And the scripture tells us that Peter and James stop and they look at him. And they say to him, look at us. And he immediately puts his attention on them because he thinks they are going to give him money. And Peter says to him, silver and gold I have not. But what I do have I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And Peter reaches out his hand and grasps his hand and pulls him up. And a man who has never walked on his own two feet knows what it is like to walk and then to run and to leap and to proclaim this amazing miracle out loud and a crowd begins to form. And as Peter and James move into the inner court with the crowd trying to figure out what has happened for this man who they know because they see him at the beautiful gate every day. There starts our reading for today. People of Israel, fellow Israelites, Peter says, you see before you a man that you know could not walk, now walking and not just walking, but running and not just running, but leaping for joy. And you somehow think we did this, but we did not. The power of the name of Jesus Christ did this. And then Peter, because he's still Peter, cannot resist the dig. You who handed Jesus over to be crucified, you who when they would have released him, no, demanded that he be kept, and had a murderer released instead. You are now witness to his power. These two pieces of scripture. They're kind of bookends for us. For what Easter tide means to us. Because it's hard for us to get in the same space. As the disciples. Easter is about victory for us. Easter is exciting, it's fun, it's happy, it happens in spring and we see things blooming around us and we are drawn into the story of the risen Christ and we celebrate that. That is our victory. Not so for the disciples yet on this day of resurrection into the next day. These men are hiding for their lives. The women have gone to the tomb. They have seen that it is empty. They have come back and told the disciples. And at least a few of the disciples have snuck out to go see for themselves that it is empty. But they are back together behind locked doors trying to figure out who has taken Jesus' body. When Cleopas and his companions show up with this amazing news and they're all talking about it and trying to figure out what's going on. And we have the advantage of knowing the Paul Harvey, right? We know the rest of the story. But they don't know it yet. And let's be fair to the disciples. If Lenita and I do a funeral in here on Monday and take a body out to the memorial garden or to the columbarium and in urn or in earth it, And that person shows up at your house the next day. Skepticism is going to have its way. What's going on here? What kind of trick is this? The disciples don't know what to think until Jesus shows up and manifests Jesus' power for them and opens their eyes. That's the right after Easter part. The Acts verse, though, is different. 
Because now Peter and James and the rest of the disciples and followers have claimed for themselves the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, we've heard the Pentecost story. Our reading from today comes from Acts 3. The power has been transferred. You see, when Jesus was together with his closest followers and friends before he died, he told them, I won't leave you alone. I will send someone to be with you, an advocate, a comforter, a helper, the Holy Spirit. And now Peter and James have fully stepped into and claimed the power of the Holy Spirit to heal this man. And they want to make it clear to all of the people gathered there that this is not power they themselves have, but rather power they receive through the risen Christ. And it got me to thinking, are we claiming the power that we have in the risen Christ? Because we all have it. That is a gift bestowed on all who believe in Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that you're going to walk out of here and see someone in a wheelchair and heal them. But I'm not saying you won't. Because it's amazing what the power of Jesus Christ can do. When the Holy Spirit moves in us, we can do things we never could have done before. And let's be honest, none of us does anything really great by ourselves. We have a spouse, or a partner, or a parent, or a friend, someone who helps us in some way to accomplish the things that we can accomplish? Well, that's true with the Holy Spirit, too. We don't do it on our own. We do it in the power of Jesus' name. There's this great movie. came out, I think, in the early 90s. Rob and I love it. It stars Steve Martin. Also has Deborah Winger, Liam Neeson, some other big names in it. Meatloaf, actually, is in it. And it's this great story of a traveling evangelist who takes his road show, his big buses and trailers from town to town, and preaches the gospel. But he's a con man. He's making it all up. And he's really good at the con. Something you find out in the opening scene of the movie when his tour bus is going 30 miles an hour over the speed limit and they're pulled over by a trooper and he gets them out of the ticket. And they pull into this very small Midwestern town and the bus breaks down. And they're going to have to be there for two or three days waiting for a part to come in to fix their bus. And so Steve Martin's character decides that this is as good a town as any. Let's set up our tents and start the show. And the sheriff in the town doesn't want to give them permits to do that because this town is in an annual drought, a drought that has been going on for several years, and these are farmers. And they are so poor by now that they have no resources. And in fact, if it doesn't start raining within the next week or so, this year's crops are going to fail too. And he doesn't want... These people here bilking money out of his constituents. And so the movie goes on and and throngs of people come into these tents every night and they give what little they have because they need to believe in a miracle. And that's what Steve Martin is promising them with healings that aren't really healings and Miracles that aren't really miracles. And I don't want to ruin it for you. It's on Hulu right now. The name of the movie is Leap of Faith. 
So if you haven't seen it, I won't ruin it for you. You should go home and watch it. It's really a great movie. But in the end of this movie, God shows up. And God shows out. And lives are changed. And real miracles and healings happen. When Steve Martin's character is relying on his own power, all he can do is con him. I mean, it's a good con. They clearly are making money. But when the power of the Holy Spirit comes, something begins to happen. And friends, we are are the people of God. We are Easter people. We are the people who know the power of Pentecost and we are the people who can take the power of the Holy Spirit into this world and make a difference. We can reach our hand out to someone and take them by the hand and pull them up and journey alongside them. We have that power. Thanks be to God. One of the ways that we are reminded of the power that we have is like Cleopas and his companion in the breaking of the bread. Like the disciples, it is in eating together. Because this feast reminds us, reminds us that Jesus sat with his most beloved and took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, Eat all of you, this is my body. It's broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he passed it to all of those gathered with him. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. For the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, God's mighty acts through Jesus Christ. And in anticipation of the mighty acts that we can do through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. We invite God to pour out God's Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. And make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And now we raise our voices together to pray that prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward so that they may be served and in turn serve you. And as they're coming up, I will remind you that this is not our table, but God's table. And everyone is welcome. At God's table, we will have four stations uh, to the outsides in the front and the back. And so you will come from the outside of your pews and return from the inside aisles.
The table of the Lord is open and you are invited to come. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, you pour your power into us through this meal and countless other ways. God, may we be not storehouses of your power, but power plants that God pour your power out onto all of your people. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. One, two. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Death has lost its victory, and the grave has been denied. Jesus lives forever. He's alive. He's alive. He's the Alpha and Omega. The first and last is He. The curse of 
sin is broken and we have perfect liberty. The Lamb of God has risen. He's alive. He's alive. Amen. Jesus is alive. We have victory, but we don't have it for no purpose. We have it so that we may go out and share it. So go out into your week knowing that you are powered by the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, go in peace. Amen. One, two.